Believe it or not, there was a time in which every telephone had a wire. And every household only had one telephone. And that made, when you had a household with four kids in it, that made things a little complicated. Because the phone rang, and when that phone rang, that one that was connected with the wire, it made the most horrible clanking sound that you could not ignore, not those cute tunes that we have now. But it made this awful noise. And somebody would undoubtedly be hauling across the house for somebody to answer that thing. It was annoying. And especially annoying in special moments like when you're sitting down for Thanksgiving dinner. The house full of guests, not just the kids, but cousins and uncles and aunts and everyone surrounding a table. And that moment where you get to sit down for that first time and enjoy and everyone joins hands and at that very moment, the phone rings. And it's not something you can ignore. And this was the very situation that my father-in-law, Richard Spivey, found himself. Table full of people and guests. They held hands. The phone rings. He gets up and answers the phone and says, I'll call you back later. Sits down. That sound right there. (laughs) See there? He sits down again. Everybody joins hands. Phone rings again gets up, answers the phone, they'll call you back, sits down. Happens a third time. Finally, after the third time, he sits down, holds hands, and everyone kind of pauses for a minute. Is it going to ring again? No, no, no. That's okay. So, okay. Now we can pray. So he bows his head and he goes, hello? Our brains don't always work the way we think they should. (laughs) Before I start with a few words I have here, let me say to echo what Jeff said to both the Wilsons and to Scott and his family, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's a huge hole that will never be filled until we see them again in that wonderful place. So I want to talk to you a little bit about a couple of verses and let you think about some things that might be applicable in other places. But in doing that, I want to give away a secret. One of the hardest things for preachers to do and probably the most anxiety-producing moment when they're confronted with the idea, oh, I have to stand up and speak to people on Sunday, is to say, what am I going to talk about? You have that decision to make. That, that's tough. That is often uh, the toughest part of the process. But I'm going to tell you there's a cheat. And the cheat is, is you can look for two things in the scriptures. You can look for repetition and you can look for lists. Those are easy, well not easy necessarily, but they're easy preparation for preaching because there it is. Let me give you a couple of examples. In terms of repetition, this is a verse we've talked about just recently that gives us the Hebrews 10 let us statements. And when you see the writer repeating a word or repeating a phrase or repeating an idea, you know he's trying to make a point. He's trying to emphasize something. And this is a place that you can stop and go, let's talk about the three let us statement. Makes for an easy place to preach. Another way to do that is when you find lists, things that are put together in some type of sequence. This happens to be, of course, the Second Peter 1 passage that Adam preached 
from last Sunday, and it gave me kind of the idea of let's talk just a little, at least begin here, of these statements about what we do to have this connection with the promises of God and be a part of the excellence of God. And as we do that, this is some pretty good preaching material right here. Easy in terms of I can talk, I can give you the bullet points right there. You see, it's already got bullet points right there. But the question that I'd like to do is how do we look at this? Because there's more to it than just simply a list. But what does it mean? And I'm going to give you a couple of ideas. This is the list from the 2 Peter 1 passage. And what we're looking at when we see a list, most of the time, we're talking about a sequence of events or a sequence of ideas that are put here and in this order for a reason. Beginning with faith and moral excellence and knowledge and self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and ending this list with love. Now, if we take another list, understand the, this quarter, the ladies' class on Wednesday night has been discussing Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. Guess what? It's another list. A list that you probably even have memorized. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. But if you put it like this, what do you see? Well, the first thing that you see is they don't line up. And that causes me anxiety. It does. But why is that? Well, I, I'll tell you the first thing that, you kind, that kind of jumps out at you. When you look at these two lists side by side, is that one of these concepts very clearly stands out. Second Peter 1 passage ends with the concept of love. The Galatians 5 passage begins with love. And that causes me to go, why is that? Why? There, there has to be some significance to why one would end the list and one would begin the list with the same concept, the same word. And so, of course, I want to see if the whole thing's turned upside down. And so, I decide to connect them all with arrows. And it looks something like well, they didn't come out all that dark, I apologize. But they go everywhere. And some of them, have to, you kind of have to go, well, there's two or three of those to this one because I'm not sure what those concepts are. And it doesn't do my brain any good. It didn't solve my problem. Until I think about it, maybe in a little bit different way. And that's what I want to share with you this morning. And I start with Denver, not Denver, Colorado, Denver, North Carolina, one of the first places that after my family and I moved here that I worked was in the little town of Denver. I had no idea when they gave me this assignment where Denver was. I thought, if it is Colorado, it's a long commute. <laughs> but let me ask you a question. How do you get to Denver? Where is Denver? I, you know, there are some people here that have no problem with that. I had a big problem with it. Now, I asked one person where Denver was, and their answer was, I didn't know where Mooresville was either. <laughs> Not helpful to me. Now, I did what every normal independent thinking person does, I ask my phone. And one of the answers was this. 
But I wanted to leave from here to get to downtown. And downtown Denver is pushing it a little bit, if you've ever been there, okay? Uh, it's both ends of the gas station, okay? But this is how you get there, from here. Poplar Tent to 85, to 485, and you got to do it on the outside, and it took me months to figure out what inside and outside there really meant. No one explained that to me either. And these directions will get you there. It's quite a hike. But that's not exactly, that may not be helpful like somebody saying just west of Mooresville, like it wasn't helpful to me. These directions may not be helpful to someone else. They may need something like this. We call, in, in the field that I work in, we call this a task analysis. My job, working with children on the autism spectrum, is it's amazing what we have to teach them. How about the concept of brushing your teeth? We break brushing your teeth down using pictures or descriptions or charts or a number of other ways, but we often have to break it down of, Go to the bathroom, stand at the sink, turn on the water, get your toothbrush, grab the toothpaste, put this. And, and this is the way that they begin to learn a concept that to us is very simple, brush your teeth. This is me getting to Denver. Get in the car, close the door, turn the key. Well, if you don't have one of those push button cars now. Uh, start the car, buckle your seat belt, Put it in drive, take your foot off the brake, and then it keeps going from there. But here's the thing. Every single one of us in this room laughs at that description, but I'm going to tell you that's where we started when we began driving a car. We began at that very place. Where do you start? Well, you start with how do I start the car? How do I put it in drive? How do I move out of the parking lot? And if you're like me, your dad probably puts you in a parking lot with a lot of room to do those first steps, right? And then it got to be where, yeah, I kind of, I know where Poplar 10 is, and I know how to get to 85 from there, and I can do that. And then ultimately I can get, yeah, I've, I've somebody figured, tell me finally where Mooresville was. Not sure I've been there yet, but I know where it is. Learning that process. Then finally, mastery. The mature idea of you need to find a destination, give me a reference point. I know where to go. Now take a look. This is the place that we often talk about, a starting place. Acts chapter 2, verses 38-39. Isn't this the beginning place? Isn't this where we put the key in the car in the ignition and begin this process of becoming a child of God and the walk that we have been charged with? This is the jumping off spot. Putting on the seatbelt and here we go. And he connects this with this idea of promise. For the promise is to you and to your children and those that are afar off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. He says, come, join in this journey with us. And this is the first step in that journey, and that promise is yours. But the thing is, is that we can't, this is not the only part of this. There's more to it. There's more to learn. There's more to grow. And that's when we come across something like 2 Peter 1. Notice that Everything about this is connected with this idea of receiving these precious and magnificent promises. And he talks about this building so that by them they may become partakers of the divine nature having uh, escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. This is the direction that he says we should be moving in and connects it with 
if these qualities are yours, the, the list that's in the smaller type, is all those statements that we read earlier, for these, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. One thing about the 2 Peter 1 passage is there is all this movement that each one growing upon another and growing upon another and growing upon another. And it says, if these are yours and are growing within you, a part of your life, and you are becoming mastery over them, then guess what? He says, you can be useful and fruitful. Now, let's talk about mature. The one thing about the Galatians 5 passage is the way it's stated is somewhat static. Now, I don't mean that in a negative way. Like you have, like you have been, this is the goal that you have been reaching for. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Tell me which one of those is not a, a huge challenge. How did we get there? Well, how do we get there is we go back and look at 2 Peter, but we'll talk about that in a second. But this is a destination. This is a goal. This is an image of the top of the mountain that we're working for. These challenging statements of what we should be in our journey in reaching for. And what is this? How does he describe this? If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Now, we talk about driving. I don't know if I'm going to put this little guy in my car, but he sure does seem enthusiastic. I thought this picture was great. So, when we're driving, what are we going to be how are we going to do this? From the Hebrews 5 passage. This is a fascinating statement. And we're going to be talking uh, um, in Q2. I'm actually going to be doing a class on Hebrews. But this, is a, this begins a really interesting section of the book. And it's a section of the book that is... All, he's, he's in the middle of an argument. He's in the middle of discussing something and he gets to this guy by the name of Melchizedek and then he just stops and says, all right, I know this is really hard stuff, but it's important stuff and it's important to you because you have a struggle. You have not matured. In fact, you have become less mature than you should have been. And he makes this powerful statement, but... Solid food is for the mature who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Let's go back to our original illustration of our little guy here driving. Most people in here at some point in time, either drive to school or drive to work, or you used to before COVID and everybody decided to work from home. But remember when you used to drive on your commute and you'd have all the things in your head about what you needed to do and, and the goals that you had to accomplish or whatever was on your mind, and all of a sudden you realized you're pulling into your parking space. How did I get here? How did I, how did, uh, what happened? I don't even remember being on the highway. I don't even remember turning on the turn signal and getting off at the exit. It's, it's that we have become so in this pattern of learning and then, oh yeah, this is what I do daily and all the time. And it becomes ingrained in us. And you sometimes scare yourself. Uh, did I hit anybody on the way? I don't remember. I, you laugh at this, and I was driving down on 85, thinking about work and my normal morning stuff, 
got to work, no problem. Happened to run into Megan Blankenship. And she says, we pulled up next to you and we're hawking our horns trying to get your attention. Clueless. I was clueless. Do you know that's what he's describing? Having our senses trained for good and evil. That evil is something like turning that wheel and getting out of the way of something, uh, an object that has fallen in the road, and I'm not going to go there. I'm going to get away from it. Or something good, and that's exactly where I want to go, and I'm going to find the route to get there. We have trained ourselves. And he says to these people that he's writing to here in Hebrews, remember that the danger, and I'm, again, giving a little bit of our class material away, but remember that he talked about drift and neglect as the big threat. That you have not trained yourselves in the ways of God and the ways of righteousness to discern good and evil. And this is a terrible danger. Think that little guy right there knows that? Not yet. But I bet he will, at least in terms of driving, and we can learn that as believers. How about Ephesians 5? A fa- passage you're very familiar with. Because he talks about for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the mature man. What's he talking about? He's talking about that very process. Now, we got the mature um, individual driving. If you've ever ridden with my father-in-law, that's not far off. Um, But we talk about maturity. What is the ultimate expression of maturity? Well, one of those is one of the most difficult concepts in all the scriptures. It is the concept of agape love, an entire chapter amongst the turmoil and challenges of the church in Corinth. He stops in the middle of all that after he has done so many, talked about so many different things, and he says, let's get back to where we need to be going. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I've become this noise-making machine, banging pots and pans together. And he ends this section with this beautiful passage. But now, faith, hope, and love abide these three. And the greatest of these is love. The idea of being able to apply true agape love to individuals, not only amongst ourselves and amongst our families, which should be a no-brainer but is often a challenge, but also, as Jesus would say, agape Our enemies, the greatest of these is love. How do we do that? I'm going to tell you, it's not with the first step. We have to learn how to do it. That's the mature Christian. Now, we say all that. Now, take a look at this list again. One is the journey. We start out... With faith, we begin with conviction that this is what we're going to do and we turn that into moral excellence and letting that fuel our growth of knowledge. Self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and that when it finally becomes what it should be, manifests itself as the greatest of these. Love. And now we look at Galatians 5. And as he talks about the fruit of the Spirit, the singular quality of them, but as you describe it as you would, the facets of a gem. What is the first one that catches your eye? 
the first one that stands out blazing in its power and its beauty. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. One is a journey. One is the goal. You want to know why the lists don't line up? Because while they are connected, they serve two different functions. One is the process, the TA, about how we get there, the task analysis in the parlance of what I do. The other is the goal we're working toward. Where are you? Just because you're in that middle, and that's where I am driving around here, Janelle gets so confused when I don't go the same way twice to the same place. I was, we were driving the other day, wandering around Kannapolis, and I don't tell her I'm wandering around. She just thinks it's really cool when I end up at the place we intended, and I'm going, in my mind, you know that was luck. Oh, that's where that street is. There we go. She, shh, don't tell her. She thinks I'm cool. But no, I'm still learning my way around this town, this area, this life. And I need passages like 2 Peter 1 to go, okay, now, what, how do I build that? How do I grow that? How do I strengthen that? Because what I'm reaching for is that beautiful, glorious mountaintop described in Galatians 5. That's where I want to be. I want somebody ultimately, ultimately to look at me and go, look at his love, look at his joy, look at the peace. Got a lot of work to do before I can get to the patience. Go back to Second Peter. <laughs> but I'm adding those things. So, there's a place that we begin, our relationship with God, how we grow, and what we're ultimately reaching for. Now, I'd suggest that you kind of take this concept and apply it across these three headings in a general sense to a lot of the passages that you're familiar with and that you'd be studying. Am I talking about, is he giving me a correction, that, that learning? Or is he talking about where I should be putting my target? Or maybe he's starting at the very beginning. Read the passages and ask yourself that question. What's the purpose? At the end of our service, we make sure that if you are at that where you start page, we want to know, we want to help, we want to encourage you. How can we serve your good? How can we help you set your feet on this path? If there is some way, why don't you come up front while we stand and sing our invitation song.